The Oklahoma City Thunder got a big win in New Orleans against the Pelicans. Josh Giddy has a great game, and there's an update on SGA's health. We'll talk about it all on today's show. You are Locked On Thunder, your daily Oklahoma City Thunder podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Get it going on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host, media member, and beat writer for InsideTheThunder.com, Ryland Styles. Follow me on Twitter at Ryland underscore Styles. Follow the show on Twitter at LO Thunderpod. On today's show, we're going to dive into SGA's update on his health and what he's feeling and his possible injury. Josh Giddy shines in this game as the Thunder pickup a big road win. Like the video, leave a review, subscribe anywhere you get your podcast from, including on YouTube. And let's get into it. Let's start with SGA because, you know, he had two things happen in this game. Number one, the rotational pattern was different for him. And number two, they revealed an injury that SGA is playing through and dealing with. So starting on the injury front, Mark Dignall announced that, you know, Shea is not 100%. That has been obvious to the eye, but it's not something that has been said aloud by the organization yet. He hasn't been on injury reports, and of course, they have not brought this up. But Mark admitted that Shea is banged up and that they're monitoring the situation, but he's certainly not 100%. And then later in that room, SGA gets to the podium and he says that uh, he hurt his quad and he's been hurt since that Utah game. He's taking it day by day right now to see how he feels. So there's your answer. Like we've been wondering what what has been limiting SGA, and it is a problem uh, related to injury. He's dealing with this quad injury that he's playing through right now. But how much do you want him playing through at this point? How do you gauge the level of importance of getting rest for SGA versus pushing for the one seed? How much would rest even help for this specific injury? I really do have confidence in the Thunder's medical staff and the Thunder's you know, thought process top to bottom of how they would handle it and not put him in harm's way. But it does open up the question for tonight's game against the Rockets, second night of a back-to-back. -back, you wonder, will he play against the Red Hot Rockets? And then this is going to be a night where the injury report does not come out until later. Uh, on the second night of a back-to-back, -back, you don't have to put out your initial report until noon local time, so it'll come out uh, you know, deep into the afternoon. It's interesting. It's something that everyone speculated about, but now you have the official designation of this quad injury that could be limiting Shea. Overall, I don't think that they'll let this get to a critical point. I, I think that when you look at this, you know, season, the most important part, independent of matchup and seeding, because you've done enough to give yourself the cushion to be a top six seed and give yourself a cushion to be a home court advantage seed. So you've done enough there that the difference in two seed or three seed or one seed and three seed is negligible whenever you factor in getting back Shea's health. And then you have to counter, you know, and count into the fact of, you know, in all likelihood, even though as we like to right now, as we sit, you know, a few weeks before the end of the season, we like to dream up this possibility of a massive game 82 where, you know, everyone's playing around the same time, the race is heated up, and you're just trying to track all the games at once and see who's in, who's out. Usually things get settled before game 82. So that's on a Sunday. Game one of your postseason series won't start till the earliest on Saturday. So that's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday that you have to rest Shea, possibly Saturday, depending on what, what day you get uh, for game one of the postseason. So you're going to get instant rest there. I don't know if if Shea should play against Houston because, again, I'm not a doctor, and I, and I do really trust the Thunder's process in all of this. But it is worth monitoring. As Mark said, Like this is something that now – will take over some of the story. And, and you can make uh, the argument that he shouldn't play against Houston. It's just that I, I don't think that they put him out you know, out on the court if he could at all you know, you know, hurt himself. And I also, 
you know, don't know the, the type of injury it is. You know, for all we know, this is an injury where you're just going to have to deal with it. Like, it's not going to get healed up. It's going to be on and off. You know, sometimes you'll feel it, sometimes you won't. And rest does little to nothing for you in the grand scheme of things. Like, so they know how to handle this stuff better than we do. It's, it's easy right now to scream, you know, sit him, sit him, sit him. But they're going to evaluate what's best for Shea. And assuredly, they will not play him if uh, it can all be re-injured uh, or, or further injured. Now, on the court tonight, Shea did deal with a different rotational pattern. He subbed out with about six minutes left in the first quarter. He typically plays the entire first quarter. This was interesting in twofold, and it's why I think that you should feel encouraged by Mark experimenting with different lineups. We're going to talk about uh, you know, the Wiggins and Hayward stuff, which is going to be the kind of flip opposite of this later. But for right now, whenever you see Mark experimenting with this stuff, this is what happened whenever you take Shea out early. J-Dub was already, you know, cooking and, and feeling it early on. He was feeling it more than Shea was early on. And he is capable of handling that bulk responsibility as a bucket getter and as a creator. And so whenever you take Shea off the floor, and especially now that we know he's dealing with that quad injury, when you take Shea off the floor, you're stealing rest for him, number one, because he doesn't return until there's two minutes left in the first. Then you play that two-minute segment and get another break with the, with the in-between quarters, which is a longer break. So, you, so now you've kind of you know, accumulated some more rest for him. But also, Shea returns to the floor to close out the first quarter while Herb Jones is on the bench. Herb Jones, their best defender, and has routinely been the best matchup for SGA you know, in the NBA, he's off the court now that you've staggered their minutes differently. And so I think that, I think that that process was a good idea. And in the postseason, where your stars are naturally going to play more and naturally going to play more minutes and increase their load, You've got to find ways to get creative with how you rest them because you can't play them 48 minutes a night as much as you want to. Uh, you know that's not that's, that's not the right formula. Also, 30 minutes a night is not the right formula. It's somewhere in between there and above 35 and below 48 where you're looking at how to play them, but also how to ma maintain their bodies. And in instance like this, where you have a guy who's cooking and you can grab SGA and you allow Jacob to cook while also allowing Shea to come back into a more loose environment where he can really get going and spark plug his game. I think it was a great decision by Mark to not be stubborn and to not just stay true to what he typically does. Great job by Mark there, and, and it helped the Thunder in this game, especially have a great second quarter uh, off of it. But overall, this was not a typical Shea vehicle. Like it was 24 points, eight assists, five boards, two steals, 45% from the floor, one for three from three. That is a, a really good basketball game. It's not a really good Shea game, but Shea still made a winning impact. I mean, you know, you can talk about the, the tap out rebound to Jada, which was a huge back breaking sequence. You want to talk about a sequence where it, it frustrates your opponent. Josh Giddy makes this brilliant behind the back pass to a wide open Lou Dort in the corner. He misses. And so you give yourself a sigh of relief of, okay, avoid a disaster there. But SGA skies up over Pelicans and taps the ball out to, to dub for a putback. And then you're back to being deflated again. He also got a rebound earlier and threw a lob to Chet off of it. Uh, great job by Chet to fly in there, recognizing that Shea had the board. He back cut uh, behind the defense and was able to clear a lane for himself. But a really good job from Shea, really good job from Chet Holmgren on that play. And, and Shea found a way to impact this game. He also got need in the face. So like he just continues to rack up these uh, bumps and these bruises and I really wonder what they're going to do against Houston because the, the tricky part about managing this stretch of the season, you no longer have a stretch where you have consecutive off days. The most off days you have the rest of the year is one. You also have a couple more back-to-backs this year, which is going to be tough to manage. Next week, your back-to-back -back is Philadelphia and Boston, both on national television. This week, it's the Pelicans. You just got, got a game from in New Orleans and the Houston Rockets. Houston, of course, playing really good basketball right now, but you look at how you'd match up with this Thunder team, and let's just say you insert Case as they have all year long for Shea, you still got to feel really good about your chances against Houston in this game at home.
So, you know, balancing that act of if you can rest him versus Houston, then you then you kind of or you know artificially get Shea two off days heading into uh, a game against Phoenix and, and and a game on the road in in the Garden, which will be tough and tougher games than than Houston. So it's going to be fascinating to see how they handle this down the stretch. But the the biggest story aside from the superstar has to be the play of Josh Giddy. We're going to get to that coming up. But first, I want to say right now, better good friends over at eBay Motors. Check them out today. eBay Motors is great, and it has everything you need to make your ride or die the MVP because passion, drive, and patience, that's what brings home the winning trophy, and it's what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level up to peak performance from superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed or power or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts to choose from, your number one ride or die will always have you looking good and have what you need for it. Uh, with the eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is going to be guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back because at eBay Motors, you're going to be burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you can choose from at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible buttons only and exclusions do apply at eBay Motors Guaranteed Fit, only available for U.S. customers. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast, on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your teams every day. Josh Giddy might be back. Hot start uh, for him today, made this win possible, and this is another great game from him. He's been stacking to this point. We, we've had multiple shows in the last month about how good Josh giddy has been getting and how he's been turning the corner. Really, uh, you know, that, that Kings game where you go back and you look at the box for that Kings game, it's not going to pop out to you, but you watch the tape of, of just his process. That's where things started to shift for him. And then you can go to that game in LA. You can go to the, the, the game that whole week, you know, the, the week of the LA game in LA. Uh, all, all this stuff has been boiling to this point. Sunday against Milwaukee, he plays fantastic with four three pointers. He comes back against New Orleans and knocks in five, a career high. Five three-pointers, and they were timely and important triples. I mean, he hit one where it was it was the the, the uh, kind of home stretch of the game, and he knocks in a three when the score is like 103, 101. Like he just hit big in these games. I think that what's most encouraging is his confidence and his ability to make the right reads and make the right plays in a hostile environment and a playoff like crowd against a playoff team, he played like this. He always does well against New Orleans. And so you you look at his game, you break it down. He opens the game with a rebound off of a Chet miss and just immediately shoots the floater with the space he has. Perfect job. Then he has a he has a, a three in the slot where, where uh, he gets the skip pass and knocks it down. Great job. He has a jab step three over uh, Valanchunas who's sacking off of him. Great job. Like, those things, and it's easy when you go five for eight from three to say, great job. Take away the shooting success. It's going to sound crazy, but independent of if the shots went in or not, this was a great game from Josh Giddy. Now, the shots happen to go in. I say that because some of that's out of your control. You know, this is a game of inches, and, and, and what if two of those threes rattled out? That would not make this a bad Josh Giddy game. He played fantastic in this game because of his decision-making. And so for a guy like, you know, Josh Giddy, who's not going to be Steph Curry, he can't truly control if the ball is going to go in or not most of the time, but he can control his thought process, his decision-making, his confidence, and his engagement level defensively. And for the last month, he's done all those things at a really high level. So credit to Josh Giddy in every way. So again, uh, to go back to his game, he runs the floor in transition really hard down the floor. And what I liked about this was you know, he dominated in transition on the ball and off the ball. The first way that he dominates in transition, he has the ball, he's dribbling up the court, and he opens up his body toward Lou Dort on the wing. And the defense obviously jumps the lane thinking he's going to pass to Lou Dort for three. But instead, that was a fake out. Josh Giddy pulls up for the floater, and it was a fantastic move by Josh Giddy. Then comes back in transition on the two on one with SGA. SGA flings him the ball over the head pass uh, on the opposite low block. He knocks in the layup on the low block. And then he comes back in transition after a check block 
And he attacks downhill, puts his defender in jail with a half-court crab dribble, spins away from rim protection, and lays it in. So boom, boom, boom. You're seeing how he can create for himself. He can he can uh, finish off plays that, that others generate, uh, and he can just take advantage of this you know system when the team gets out and runs. And that's why the Thunder are so successful in transition. He had a great intra, uh, you know, you know, through traffic push shot uh, where, uh, you know, he was driving in. I think the ball got kind of jarred loose a little bit, but he didn't panic. You know, gets it up and, and, and hits in the hits in the post shot or the push shot. He got a skip pass from uh, J-Dub, a, a drive and kick skip pass, and knocks in the three. Another corner three in a tight game from him. And his fifth three was down one late uh, with a score 103 to 101, I believe it was. Uh, and that was his fifth three. His only miss of the night, and this is a great example of what I talked about with, with remove the shot success. His only miss of the night was a great play by him playing off the catch, getting his defender on his heels, uh, knifing through the lane. He goes from the slot to the opposite elbow, really, rises up you know, in the mid-range. He takes the shot. It's a clean look. It didn't go in, but he was confident. He was decisive, uh, and, he did, and he did not let the defense dictate or react to him, uh, and so he was able to free himself up for a shot. Uh, that, you know, if you can improve that, if you can work on your mid-range game, that can be a distinct weapon for you. 25 points, nine rebounds, four assists, 10 for 14 from the floor. Again, only one miss inside the arc, which is ex in incredibly encouraging to, to have one miss inside the arc whenever you had five makes. Because the three-point stuff is out of most people's control. Most people are not Steph Curry. But as a 6'9 player, 6'8, 6'9, he claims he's 6'9. As a 6'9 player, you've got to be able to finish at the rim and to use your frame to your advantage. He's been doing such a better job at that here recently. Whether it be the floater, whether it be that, that Dirk fade he's been working on since FIBA, whether it be just attacking downhill hard. And so he stacked a few good games together to the point where you're looking at now a few weeks of good play with some great pops in there as well. Like, so he's been good to great for, could we agree three weeks? He's been good to great. And it feels repeatable. It all feels like things that he can control. He can control how much effort he gives defensively, which directly sparks transition. He can control how hard he attacks the basket, which most of the time will lead to success. He can control if he's not hesitant to shoot the three. I think that this game against Houston will be an important one. Because, you know, Josh Giddy, you know, he's had games where he has success against bad teams. Uh, he's had success against great teams, like Milwaukee's a great team. The Pelicans are playing really good at basketball right now. You know, independent of record and what the expectations are, Houston has played Josh Giddy incredibly well. Uh, Houston has been a bit of a thorn in the side. Just as he's played, just as he's played great basketball in New Orleans, you know, he has not played great against Houston overall. I want to see him, especially with no Shingun, you know, play really well against Houston. And I think that he will. I really do. I think that when you look at uh, the ways that Josh Giddy has a lot of success, you know, part of it is how successful he is playing in space and using that space to his advantage as a driver. And Houston doesn't have a ton of guys who can deter shots. You know, when Jack Lindell's in there, it might be a little difficult. But... I really do believe in this version of Josh Giddy turning a leaf for him to being a good player. And again, I'm not going to say he's a superstar or he's figured it all out or he's a star player, but can he be the fifth best starter and the fifth best defender on the floor? I think that over the last three weeks, he's answered that question, yes. And if that question is answered, yes, this Thunder team is increasingly dangerous. And Josh Giddy is a part of that. Because if, if, you, if you get a game like this from Josh Giddy in the playoffs, which, to Josh Giddy's credit, as a 21-year-old, he's typically, and a lot of you Australians in the comments who wear me out every day, you guys can attest, he typically plays best when the lights are bright. You saw it last year in New Orleans in the play-in. You saw it in the NBL. So he might be a playoff riser in general. So him hitting his stride at this stage of the season and at, and at this new role, which he's taken time to adjust to and to adapt to, it could all be, you know, culminating in a, a really successful postseason run. We'll see what it looks like, though, uh, from here on out. Also, going to be watching him incredibly closely against Houston, who's played him very well. 
But Jalen Williams, wow, was he ever cooking in this game? Just an unreal step back with with minimal time on the shot clock. He was like three seconds left on the shot clock. Jalen Williams is so good at not getting sped up when the clock gets late and uh, being able to take advantage of that fact of being under control and understanding how much time he truly does have. That internal clock is really good for him. Uh, he's He used that power dribble really well to play off the catch. Uh, I think that when you watch him, his array of gathers helps him get through traffic. You saw him a few times, you know, as he's driving in, he gathers the ball really high up over the defense, uh, which just can lead to and ones, uh, or he can go low through traffic as well to free him up. Uh, it's very much, uh, you know, shades of Shea, who they, they talk a lot about how much that they work together with, uh, with each other. One of the best sequences of the night was, was whenever J-Dub got a block at the rim, then runs the floor in transition and gets an and one on the other side. Few players can make that happen. A couple killer step backs, a couple stop on a dime mid-range jumpers. The versatility from Jada, I think uh, one thing that gets undersold a little bit is his versatility is just like a simple play finisher. You, know, you, you get wrapped up a lot in the star power and the star dumb of, of, of Shea and Jada both. But the simple plays are often what's going to come to flourishing in the postseason. And one of those simple plays was the fact that he can go set a screen for Shea then float his way to the corner, sit there and wait for the for the drive and kick, and then knock down a catch and shoot jumper. Where he's where he's just fantastic at things like forty percent. I tweeted it out his catch and shoot number uh, in, in those chances. And then I just love his physicality, driving right past his man on the perimeter, uh, meets the rim protector, putting his chest on him uh, to free up space at the rim. Twenty six points, a team high. Five assists, two rebounds, a block, 50% from uh, three, 50% from the floor. Uh, Josh Giddy, 25 points, so just one off of the team high. Nine rebounds, four assists, 10 for 14 from the floor, only one miss inside the arc, and five for eight from three. Those two guys were really good. Let's talk about the bench. Let's talk about uh, Chet Holmgren, and let's talk Gordon Hayward uh, and the whole Wiggins DNP. But first, I want to say right now, but our good friends over at Amazon Fire TV. Check them out today because I think you're really going to enjoy it. With Amazon Fire TV, uh, you're going to have the absolute best time because Fire TV is your destination for sports from live games to highlights to in depth analysis. Fire TV offers you an amazing viewing experience with your smart TV, as well as your Fire TV stick that can plug into your existing TV that provides you access to millions of movies, TV episodes, as well as free uh, live TV, whether it's opening weekend of baseball or college basketball tournament, or you just want to have your Fire TV and, and watch all the great content there. Fire TV recently created a Fire TV channels to deliver you a constant supply of the latest videos of your favorite sports brands all for free. That includes all of us at Locked On. So make sure you go there right now because uh, most of the big pro sport leagues and college conferences as well are there for you from us at Locked On on, fi on Fire TV channels. So go there right now. It lets you dive into the game deeper with analysis, highlights, and more. Keep up to date with the latest news in the sports world from March Madness, NBA, M MLB, and lots more. Not to mention the great news, entertainment, gaming, uh, travel, and cooking videos as well. Go check out Fire TV channels at the Fire TV and on the Alexa devices. If you're uh, just now getting checked out with the Fire TV channels, uh, you should go there. Trust me, it's going to be great uh, and check them out right now because you can learn more by visiting Amazon TV slash Locked on Fire TV. That's Amazon.com slash Locked on Fire TV. Amazon.com slash Locked on Fire TV. Also want to say right now about our good friends over at Nissan. Nissan's great because no matter what you're looking for, it can help you push further and it can help you on your next adventure and our friends at nissan have the lineup of suvs with the capabilities to take you to the next level from the nissan rogue which is perfect for city drives and great escapes with classic google built in uh, and, and some great maps and google assistance and google play stores for you built right in to their 12.3 inch hd touchscreen information system to the nissan pathfinder uh, with room for up to eight with their expansive cargo capacity and advanced uh, available 4x4 capacity with 284 horsepower and up to 6,000 pounds towing with the 
uh, adventure that's calling you. The Pathfinder can get you there and answer the call. So go check them out, whether it's the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or, or even the Nissan Armanda. Uh, go find your next big adventure at shopnissanusa.com. Shop at nissanusa.com, nissanusa.com. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast and the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much for making us your first listen every single morning, every single day. We're here for you talking Thunder basketball. Well, Gordon Hayward versus Aaron Wiggins, the, the talk of the town on Thunder social media. You know, I, I think that you all know my opinion of Aaron Wiggins. I think he is the best, one of the best rotational pieces on the Thunder. I think that he's proven that time and time again, he can impact this team in a winning way. And he can, like a chameleon, kind of fit into any lineup that you want him to and, and play a multitude of positions. But it's it's been made clear that, that that's not really aligned with maybe the, the practice point of the organization to this point in the season. And Mark was asked about Wiggins' DNP, and he says that Wiggins was live tonight, you know, so he was healthy. Uh, but he just wanted to, uh, you know, capitalize on the start that the team got off to uh, because he thought that the group was great out there and that they, he kind of rolled with them uh, and it drifted Wiggins out of the rotation. He said that he planned on using Wiggins, but they were off to such a good rhythm. He didn't want to disrupt that. Uh, so that was what happened in this specific game. Uh, obviously there's, you know, talk because of Gordon Hayward's lack of production with you know, zeros across the board in this game. I will say that, that Gordon Hayward, nobody wants to hear it right now as he goes over two. Uh, and, and doesn't log a stat, and he's and he's minus 19 in this game uh, in 10 minutes. No, nobody wants to hear it right now, but there are things that Gordon Hayward does It's not on a box score, like providing uh, spacing and, and the threat of shooting, which opens up some lanes for other people. That being said, I personally, who am not the coach, and don't claim to know more than the coach, I personally would play Wiggins over Gordon Hayward and would play Wiggins uh, a lot more minutes than, than, he, than he currently gets. Uh, I wonder... And I've been theorizing with, with just total speculation and nothing else but that. I've been wondering, like, is the reason why you're not playing Wiggins a ton because you know what Wiggins is? You know, as much as I like Wiggins, no offense to him, there's not some untapped level he can get to. This is it. He's an incredible Swiss Army knife rotational player uh, who can provide an impact off the bench and be a part of your depth. Whereas for the Thunder in the last 14 games, you 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 want to keep pushing Hayward out there to ensure you're not missing something. In the sense of what if he starts clicking all of a sudden in the next in the next two weeks? That changes what you can do in the playoffs. So I say that to say this. I understand the frustration. I I, of course, have been advocating for Wiggins since the summer league of his rookie year. So I get it. You know, me and Mavs draft the day after the draft got together on this podcast and said, he's going to be the next guy to get converted and, be, and have a stable NBA role. So I've been there with the Wiggins camp. What I'll say is this. Let's see how the playoffs go. Right? If, if, if Hayward's not clicking and they're still playing him over Wiggins in the postseason, at that point, uh, it becomes a bigger deal to me. Right now, I think that you know that you can trust Wiggins. You know you can trust Wiggins to stay ready. You can trust Wiggins to, to play it in any lineup. You can trust Wiggins to play, you know, even if you needed to tonight, you could trust Wiggins to not play for three quarters and play in the fourth quarter. So he's gotten that experience of starting of off the bench in the fourth quarter after not playing, in starting the second half after not starting the first half, of not playing the first quarter and then finishing out the game in the second, third, and fourth quarter. He's gotten to move around that chessboard a lot. And with Gordon Hayward, you only have a finite amount of time to make your decision of, of if you're going to play him in the postseason. And right now, I would have that answer be, you better play Wiggins over Hayward in the postseason, in my opinion. Let's see what, the, what happens come postseason time. Whenever the um, experimentation isn't over, but you get closer to, hey, nothing else but winning games matters. And if you get to that nothing else but winning games matters standpoint, it's tough for me to believe that there are not, uh, you know, that there are players above Wiggins who, who should play in that role, right? Right now, you still want to bring around Hayward because if Hayward pops, he gives you better postseason minutes than a lot of this bench. If he pops to what he, he at his peak still can be. But if he never does get there, 
then yes, you should be playing Wiggins. The, 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 the towing, the line, the thunder are walking is they've under, they understand what Wiggins is. And Wiggins, to his credit, has made himself to the point where he could not play for the next 14 games and then play game one of the playoffs and, and be a massive impact positive player. So uh, it's kind of a double fold there. It's worth monitoring. I get your frustration. I've made no you know, bones about uh, how much I uh, you know, think Wiggins should be playing, but let's just see what it looks like in the postseason. And then we'll reevaluate this conversation. Trust me, we will. Uh, but it is interesting. Uh, speaking of rotations, I think, they, I think that Kenneth Williams, it, it did wonders for him to have those five days off where they, where they rested in that Jazz game uh, and that created five days off for him. He looked really good next to Chet. I, I liked that lineup a lot. He played really good transition defense. There was one opportunity where uh, he's playing in between two guys and takes away the paint while Lou Dort flies into the corner and the Pelicans just bogged down and do not capitalize on transition uh, and, and ended up you know, losing out on that possession. Six points, three boards, two assists, and a steal. Cason Wallace liked seeing him create a little bit more. Uh, he was putting horns with, with Joe as the screener, and that led to an easy floater for him. He splashed a three in the corner. He blocked the jumper, raced ahead in transition, and got a touchdown pass from Jay Will on his way to seven points, a rebound, one for one from three, uh, and one missed field goal. Isaiah Joe had a massive three to put OKC up nine in the first half, drew a charge against Zion Williamson, and found his way at six points, three boards, two assists, and a steal. Two for four from three overall, but goodness gracious. In a game this tight, standing in against Zion and getting a charge to swing it from a three-point Zion play to zero points and a foul on Zion, that is in and of itself a, a huge accomplishment and like a huge uh, positive play for the team. But to take it against Zion, it is. That's tough. That's tough. Uh, Jay Will uh, boomed in a three, touchdown pass to Joe, three points, seven boards, two assists. I, I thought that there were some great Chet plays in this game. He had the jab step over Larry Nance, and, and you want to see him do that more. You want to see him just, hey, you know, you can shoot over these guys. It might not be the perfect shot, but for you, a, a good shot for Chet is better than maybe a, a great shot for others whenever you can make it like that over, over Larry Nance. Uh, the, the good back cut for the Shea Lob. Uh, and then he just had two two blocks where he just obliterated them at the rim. He, he had a great play where he caught the ball at the elbow, gets the mid paint spin fade away against uh, Valanchunas. Great cut from the top of the key for a bounce pass from Shea where, where Chet collects the pass and immediately pushes his shoulder into his defender to free himself up. That came off of a Shea post up, which I think can really be deadly for the Thunder when you put Shea uh, on the weak side as a post up guy back to the basket, and then you just have action off of it where Shea can either turn around and hit a baseline jumper, or he can facilitate and get the ball to a guy like Chet diving at the rim. Uh, hit a pick and roll for Jadab for the alley-oop, and he keeps improving as a screener. Really good job getting in the way and freeing Jadab up uh, in the lanes for a nice finish to, to really put the dagger in the Pelicans in this game. But Zion was awesome, and, and it's another matchup where, like, there wasn't much the Thunder could have done to stop Zion. And a few teams have have the ability to stop Zion. That's why he's a really good player. But I think overall, he's just awesome. Uh, I think that you also saw the importance that that like these things will stack up in the postseason. Herb Jones gets five fouls at the 10-minute mark in the fourth quarter. And he gave away two of the five by reaching in on, reaching in on Isaiah Joe and fouling Lou Dort on a jump shot. Like that stuff, you've got to cut out in the postseason if you're Herb Jones. And if you're the Thunder, you've got to capitalize on that, as the Thunder did. Uh, the Thunder once led by 20 points, never trailed by more than five. Six ties, six lead changes. The Thunder, you know, in the in the breakdown of these columns and these in these points where I was go over, the Thunder actually had a weird game where they won the rebound battle 49 to 43, but the Thunder turned it over 12 times to New Orleans as nine. That's typically flipped. Both of those things are rebounds and, and turnovers. Uh, the Pelicans won second chance points 10 to six. The Thunder won points in the paint by two, 52 to 50. The Pelicans won fast break points, 18 to 13. That's typically flipped in OKC's favor. The Thunder shot 53, 44, 85. Pelicans shot 45, 36, 87. The Thunder get win number 50. My goodness. Tied for the most uh, 50 win seasons in the NBA in the last 15 years. Eighth, 50th win season. They were on pace to do it in, in the bubble season uh, before the shutdown with Chris Paul spoiled spoiled is the word of the day for this thunder fan base that's gotten to experience 
all of the success. And I think it's great to, to point out that a year ago in, in October, the Thunder were projected to be the worst team in the NBA. They go when they finish two games below 500. Now they go from two games below 500 to hitting the 50 win mark with like 14 or 13 games left. Special stuff, special stuff from this Thunder team. MVP of the game is of course, Josh Giddy. Uh, Upcoming schedule, Thursday, Rockets recap, Friday, special guest, Saturday, Suns recap, Monday, Knicks recap. A lot to get to. Subscribe anywhere you get your podcast from, including on YouTube. And until tomorrow, be good and be good to one.